Give me one moment. Hey, uh, so welcome to today's webinar. My name is Matt. I will be hosting for you. Uh, we are joined today by Randall Hale. Randall is the owner and operator of North River Geographic Systems, and he specializes in free and open source software for geoinformatics. Um, Randall, I'll hand the floor over to you. Cool. Uh, hey, from Tennessee. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, yeah, not, not anywhere in Texas currently, but have been through Texas. I may drive down for the 10 year anniversary. That could be, uh, it could be fun. Sounds like fun. So, hey, so I'm going to blabber on about open source. And it was really kind of funny. Naomi, who I saw in the, uh, in the, in the meeting popped up last week, last Tuesday and said, Hey, good luck on your talk. And I went into a panic because I hadn't started writing the presentation yet and uh, realized it was just a, a preliminary uh, check through. So, um, but open source, hopefully you guys have all used it. You've probably used QGIS uh, to some extent. Maybe you've used PostGIS, maybe you've done a little bit of this and that. So I'm gonna kind of give you a, uh, just kind of an overview of open source and where it stands right now. The, the, the fun, um, I was going to say the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is always a little bit of ugly mixed in, but mostly good, mostly fun. Um, <clears throat> so let's see if I can get this kicked off. So yeah, I got a couple of stories to tell you about open source and kind of how I got mixed up, messed up in this. Um, I used to work for the feds, uh, worked for TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, in their maps and surveys department. So if you ever come, you know, anywhere in this direction, uh, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, and you have you happen to pick up an old school seven and a half minute topo map, you'll see at the bottom, you know, created by TVA maps and surveys. And they did a lot of production work. Um, worked for them for 16 years, left to do consulting, um, mainly work now in open source GIS. I was, I started out being an Esri business partner uh, back in 06. Did that for a few years and it just, it was, eh, it was okay. Wasn't anything great and um, kind of got into open source, which I'm going to tell you about how I kind of fell into that. And I, uh, I'm a small business supporter of QGIS. I uh, donate money to them. I uh, teach classes on, on their behalf as a community trainer. Any classes I teach, money goes back into their account to help with development of the software, mainly dealing with data. Uh, I, I hate to call myself a data analyst because I think that's uh, a bit overkill, but I do love uh, cleaning up data, and uh, I'd rather be canoeing, <laughs> more or less. Cano canoeing's a lot of fun. We've got a lot of that to do over here in, uh, around the Chattanooga area, um, but a small story. How in the world did I get into using open source? Because I, uh, um, I mean, I started out using ARC. I'm an Ezra guy. We, we all started, probably doing that. And so I went to work out of college into TVA's mapping department. They put out a call. They need some interns. I went in and um, started using ARC Info 6. I don't know how many you guys were, were blessed at using the old school, you know, ARC Info stuff, but, but um, it was fun. <laughs> it was weird. And uh, through all of that, I mean, we were doing it on, on Unix, Unix workstations, and um, kind of kicking along. Started playing around Linux, started playing around with some different things. I mean, we had a lot of computer equipment at TVA and uh, made, it, made it to be quite fun. Um, and did that, like I said, did that for 16 years, started doing consulting work, and uh, immediately jumped in, became an Esri business partner and a certified trainer. So I did the whole training regiment with, with Esri until they killed it. Um, so I was a VP with them and kind of just left. Um, so it wasn't really working out too well. Consulting's a hard gig, kind of weird, kind of wild. And in 2012, I was a little bit burned out. And so another firm down in Atlanta called me and said, hey, how would you like to go somewhere? And I'm like, yeah, I would like to very much like to go do something different. And uh, went to go work a job in the Caribbean for about six months off and on. And I'd go down and work for a bit, come back. And I was actually helping build an addressing system with uh, AppGeo and Spatial Focus. Uh, Spatial Focus is in Atlanta, AppGeo is in Boston. And um, 
much to my chagrin, 95% of this project was using open source. They were using PostGIS, they were using OpenJump, they were using, uh, I mean, it was a weird and wild time of command line tools and just bare basic geo. Uh, it was really crazy. And again, I had a full license of Arc Info, but everybody said, hey, don't take your really good workstation down there because it's probably going to end up getting stolen or something's going to happen to it or you're going to drop it in the ocean. Who knows? So I went to Best Buy, bought the cheapest laptop that I could work with. Uh, it would barely run Windows. I think it was 7. I think Windows 7 was on it, Windows 7 Home. I loaded Linux on it, Open Office, Open Jump, all this stuff and went down there to go work and we were using a combination of ArtPad and Fulcrum. Uh, at one point, we are using the Trimble Juno units, walking around, recording locations. We switched to cell phones because everybody had a cell phone and made it a lot easier. And uh, what I learned from all of that was that I could actually create data and not use a commercial license, not, not use a, a ESRI license to create shape files, spatial light uh, databases running with post GIS. Um, I could connect remotely to stuff. It really kind of opened the open my eyes up a little bit. And through all of that mess, I found that I really didn't enjoy open jump very much. You can still download it and use it. And I would encourage you to download it and run it. But I found this really cool program called QGIS. And it was, I think it was one eight or one six, but it was raw claw. Um, was the version I started using. And it was it was rough. And there, there was no processing tools. I could make shape files. I could make PDFs. And that just kind of worked for me at that point. So I found myself producing a lot of on-the-fly maps, sending field crews out, and just, you know, kind of working. I'm going, well, if I can do this here, why can I incorporate this into my business when I get back, you know, off of this assignment? And um, you know, it led into a whole jump into open source and, and what was open source and what what it what could I do with it? What couldn't I do with it? And in 2012, it was a little bit rough around the edges. You had grass, uh, the grass package was pretty much running full speed. You had open jump, you had post GIS, you had QGIS kind of in its infancy. I mean, it, it had been out now, I guess, probably five years at that point. And you know, start reading up. And there's several definitions of open source. And the kicker you got to remember, the whole thing with this is um, you hear it called freeware, shareware, all this stuff. And really, it's none of those things. It's just, a, it's, it's a program that's been written. You can study the source code. If I looked at the source code, anything, it, it would be terrible. Uh, nobody wants me programming or, or looking at source code, but I can share it. I can run it however I want to run it. Um, you know, I can, I can give you a copy of it. I can mail a copy of it to uh, Matt. I can, uh, you know, give all of you in the presentation a copy of QGIS and it's perfectly free, legal, and, and everything's good. And I can change it. And if I change it, I can modify it. I give those modifications back to the community. And, uh, yeah, it just works. It works out well. And it's a really great communal way of kind of, you know, sharing and working with software. Um, so this is the, what you see on this slide is the, the four freedoms, I guess, of, of open source. And like I said, there's several different definitions of uh, how open source works and, and, and what it is. But so how, you know, we do GIS, we're, we're into that. How, how long has open source been around and geo and 78 is usually the starting point when you when you do a little bit of digging with the moss program and uh i think it was last year during the pandemic i mean a lot of people were doing a lot of stuff for two years uh, especially in 2020 and somebody found an actual working copy of moss from 1978 so it's been loaded on github you can download it i don't know what it would run on um but you can get it uh grass started this development in 82 uh, Corps of Engineers, and it was released, oh man, sometime in the early 90s, they kind of turned it loose on the world. And uh, the Project 4 Libraries map server, you know, putting maps out on the web, not anything horrendously new. We were doing it in 95 uh, with map server. 
Um, PostGIS came out, which was the database end of everything. You can think of it kind of like SDE for the for the Esri crowd. Of course, I don't know what I think SDE has been deprecated in something else now or whatever. I'm, I have gleefully not touched Arc Pro in like two years. So I'm a little bit behind on the Esri terminology and. Um, you know, QGIS came out, uh, QGIS 1.0 was in, in, in 2006, OSGO, which I'll talk about, got started um, in 2006. And as of this year, um, I mean, in 2022, QGIS is now going to be in its, its 3.28 release, Proj has migrated to 8, uh, Grass is changing, I mean, everything's kind of, it's really active out here. Uh, there's never a lack of things to learn about in the uh in the open source realm and the nice thing is there's not really any real money involved in it so if i want to learn something about map server download it and run it figure it out read the directions operate you know talk to the community and see what's happening and, and you know as an example grass i've got seven eight running i think eight one is currently um has just been released a lot of the, some of the development or actually i should say a chunk of the development happens over in north carolina uh, there's another piece happening over in germany and um, it, it's it's not the prettiest interface but man it will it is awesome for raster for elevation data for lidar for any of that stuff it, it is great all day long um, I use it quite a bit still, uh, even processing elevation models. In Tennessee, we're lucky enough, all that stuff was kind of handed out and given away. So we've got, because Tennessee participated in the, um, uh, what was it, the, the USGS program um, for LIDAR acquisition, all that stuff is now freely available. And so I can run it and play with it. And, you know, again, for those of you kind of hopefully sort of new to this open source thing, Again, Brian was telling me you guys had had quite a few presentations on, on QGIS and, and different things it's doing. And I'm going to go through a demo here at the end and just talk about some stuff with QGIS and with LIDAR. Um, but usually how open source happens, and this kind of relates to another slide down the road. Um, yeah, somebody has an itch. Somebody wants to do something. Somebody has a problem they need solved. Maybe they're a programmer. Maybe they hire a programmer. and uh, they start a project and that project will either build a community around it or it won't. If it doesn't build a community, it's probably gonna not succeed. If it does start to build a community, you know, the project gets even bigger and you attract more developers. The nice thing with open source, this is all interrelated. So the, the guys working on QGIS will interact with the guys or, or with the people, not necessarily guys, but but with people over in um, um, over in the grass community. Maybe they'll communicate. the 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 G doll or Google community will operate with. Um, you know, we'll talk to the QGIS crowd. Maybe they will talk to the Poodle crowd or the P doll crowd, which deals with lidar. Maybe that group will also interface with Post GIS. So it's 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 a very intertwined, very intermingled group of people which makes you know interoperability so much greater uh, i can pick usually any one of two or three things and start building a stack of software thinks about anything i've got going uh, makes it makes it pretty nice and you know and as you see these projects grow um the community will start interacting, as I said, with other software projects. Possibly they join OS, OSGO, and OSGO is another big parent organization in the open source crowd. Uh, I think the membership is free. All you have to do is wade through the uh, wade through the registration on the wiki process, and you too can become a member of OSGO. And uh, from then on, it's just a matter of does this project survive? You know, is is it a duplicate of another existing project? If it's a duplicate. Maybe it gets merged in, you know, maybe it gets merged in with another um, another project or something else happens happens there. Um, maybe it, it, it grows on and grows into another, you know, into another component to another piece of software. It's just, uh, you know, there, there's the sky's the limit, so to speak, for what happens. And OSGO, again, after mentioning that, um, you know, all these open source projects aren't just... Uh, you know, dangling out into the wind. 
um, they're, they're, they're not really, it's not like they're unsupported. The, the OSGO is an organization, uh, they're non nonprofit, and uh, they provide a little bit of financial, legal, community building, some help with these open source things. And it's pretty fascinating. There's most of the, all this runs off email lists, which I know is probably pretty old and old school way of doing it, but it's a lowest common denominator. So you can join, a, you know, generally join an email list. Some have Slack channels, some have a uh, Gitter, which I think is part of the GitHub ecosystem of stuff. There's a there's like a wiki or something on there where you can discuss things. But you know, OSGO provides conferences, uh, some financial help, some stability, um, and in fact, the the current OSGO conference, the last one was in Florence, Italy. Uh, that one happened two weeks ago, three weeks ago ish, maybe a month. Uh, the next one will be in Kosovo, the big international meeting. Um, we're having a, uh, probably next year, there's going to be a FOS4G North America meeting somewhere. We're trying to figure out where uh, that's going to happen. Um, we're having a meeting. And actually, I added a slide, and I think, if you excuse me just a second while I dance around, Somewhere there's going to be a slide in here that's completely out of whack uh, on the Nashville meeting. So I'm going to do a, um, a meeting in Nashville. I'll put a link in the chat uh, where we're going to try to get as many people together as we can around the area in open source. If you happen to find yourself in the Nashville, Tennessee, somewhere in that area, November 30th through December 2nd, show up. Um, if you can't swing the 25, I'll slip you in the back door. Uh, so you can come in and, and hang out, but we're going to get Howard Butler to come down and, and uh, you know, and these open source conferences, it's like any conference. They're a hoot. They're fun, uh, especially because the last two years we haven't really been in a room together because of COVID and all this other stuff going on. Um, so the it was, you know, it was a pretty big deal for uh, the Florence, Italy uh, conference to happen. And the really cool thing was, which, it wasn't that cool, but in, in, in um, the, the 2020 conference was supposed to be in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and it was all um, all recorded. So you can go up to YouTube and watch a ton of open source and still very timely, even from, you know, being a year or two, year or two ago, uh, discussions on open source software, anywhere from PyGeo API to QGIS to uh, training classes to all kinds of stuff. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. I'll try to relay information as FOS4G North America starts kicking up uh, on where it's going to be. And it, it'll be a fun, it'll be fun. It'll be a hoot to, uh, to go to. Um, so yeah, and join OSGO. Go to OSGO.org, sign up on the wiki. You too can become a member. Um, and so, you know, as a consultant, I mean, North River Geographic Systems, 99% of my life is open source. And so I get a lot of people calling me up and I see some, some chattering going on in the, in the chat. You know, how can we leverage open source? What can we do? This, you know, can we replace our commercially bought stuff with the open source stuff? Generally, yes. But <laughs> to, do you want to do that? Uh, can we do that? What's going to be the good, the bad, you know, with doing that? And generally what I tell people, you know, with, with open source, there's a lot of pros to it. And four of the pros are it's standards based. Nobody's doing anything crazy where they're going to loop you into some software or a data format or something that you can't get out of. Uh, GeoPackage, I don't know how much of you have experience with GeoPackage. Man, it has made my life easy because uh, <laughs> Um, I can hand stuff off to the Esri people very, very easily now in GeoPackage, vector data, and Art Pro can read it. So Art Pro can create a GeoPackage, give it to me, I can edit and do whatever I need to do, and it works. Um, you know, open source is very interoperable. It works great. It follows OGC standards. So you know, like I said, nothing really crazy is going to happen out here where you're going to get locked into something you can't get out of it. Um, Support can be commercial or community-based. I have people paying me for commercial support for QGIS. They could very easily go get a community-based support. Now, you know, responses may be slower, but community-based supports 24-7, 365. There's always somebody awake somewhere. 
Uh, so you can sling an email out to the QGIS crew, post GIS geo server, any of these pieces of software and get an answer. May not be the answer you want, but you'll get an answer. Uh, and the software tends to change slowly. Nothing's really gonna break. Um, you can get uh, the next version of QGIS is gonna come out next week. Maybe this week, I wanna say there's another version coming. I have no doubt it's gonna work fine. Um, they do a one month you know, run through the software before it gets released. So it gets kind of informally released here in the next little bit. I'm not worried about stuff breaking. It's gonna be okay. Um, the cons to open source, you got to have your tech hat on. You need to know, you know, kind of what's happening with software. You may have to do some installation. You may have to do some troubleshooting. Uh, you may feel a bit niche or a bit niche, niche, um, depending um, on what happens. Uh, and the software does tend to change slowly. I'm kind of a fan of slow. Early on, 10, 15 years ago, I loved quick development. These days, I don't want stuff to break, so go slow. I think, I think you know, changing slow is good and bad. Um, and I'll talk about this with QGIS, kind of how it, it works. So, and I get a lot of people asking me, well, how do I get training? For, you know, I can go online and take a MOOC or, or however you pronounce it um, from Esri. Where do I get trained for, for open source stuff? Well, it depends. A lot of companies offer training. Um, I center training around QGIS. Um, you'll find training at conferences. So if you go to Phosphor G North America, if you make the big international, there's going to be a lot of training opportunities. Um, there's a lot of free training. Uh, Grass has a very good free training, a lot of demo stuff that they put up. Um, you can email developers and talk to them. And um, you know, it's it's makes it really nice. I've got a couple of developers I can just email and go, hey, what's happening? I got a problem. And or how do I do this? And, and they'll kind of walk me through, you know, within reason. You don't want to bog them down in too much, you know, if, if the problem's too big. Um, some companies offer training. Uh, you can make your own training manual. There's no reason you can't do that. And uh, there's books out. Locate Press does a lot of books. They've got QGIS, PostGIS, um, cartography books. They're mainly open source. I think they're all open source at Locate. Um, you can get training. Training isn't, you know, you may have to look a little bit, but you can get it. So what does Randy use? You know, what, what kind of weird, fun, funky stuff am I using? QGIS is my first love. I use it for about everything. Uh, PostGIS is my database um, of choice. Most of my life now centers around databases. And I didn't grow up in a database environment. I grew up, you know, Arc, Arc Workstation, we had coverages. Arc, earlier versions of ArcMap, you had shape files. Eventually, you had file-based geodatabases and some Oh, the access personal geodatabases, the access-based ones, which are still, I think, still used. Uh, hopefully Pro is killing that one off, but um, Google or GDAL is a command line data conversion piece of software. Um, and it works great. You can type out commands, save scripts, works great. Uh, Poodle is command line, LiDAR manipulation. And I actually put the wrong URL up there. I'll get that fixed and uh, send this send a slideshow out to uh, Brian and and, uh, and Matt so they can send it all to you guys. Uh, QGIS server, I'm just learning about this one. I was very dismissive about it because it seemed very uh, hard to deal with. And I've been reading up and learning about it. And last night was my second whack at trying to get it running. And I'm just not reading the directions right. I'm I tend to get a little bit hard-headed in reading directions. I think I'm still being hard-headed on this one. Uh, Map Server is a blast to run. It's just weird and wild. And they just released version eight. Uh, like I said, Grass, probably one of the oldest pieces of open source software still being developed, still being used, and just stable. PG Routing lets you run, uh, you know, how do I get from point A to point B? It runs on top of... Uh, Post GIS, Postgres, Leaflet, build your own web map, 
and OpenStreetMap is literally too big to explain. Oh man, <laughs> it's it's a lot. It's a database. It's software. It's a community. It's a crazy pants. It's its own little world of of stuff. And so, uh, I tend to tell people getting an OpenStreetMap, tread lightly, give it a shot, edit your edit your neighborhood. You can actually go in and edit your neighborhood in OpenStreetMap and make a better map um, for people. And a lot of people are using it. Apple's using it. Um, Telenav, TomTom, different people are pulling this in. And uh, I tend to watch, I tend to pay attention to it and working with clients because they it, it helps. Um, helps them out a lot of times, especially with 911s. I try to go in and fix road names and, and uh, make sure roads are in OpenStreetMap that need to be in OpenStreetMap. And uh, so what's happening now in 2022? I know this is a lot. I'm running through a lot of stuff, but I want to get to the demo. Um, Goodle is now a formal organization. They've actually coalesced. They've got funding. And um, they, they are now more of a formal organization than ever before. So it's no longer like the wild, wild world, wild, wild west out there. Um, Proj just keeps getting better. Uh, they finally started redevelopment several years ago, and I've got a slide on that coming up on kind of how that happened. Grass is moving to a new interface. It's been, what, man, early 90s, and they've always had a two-window interface. They're going to a single-window interface. Not everybody's thrilled about it, but, you know, it's 30 years in the making. We don't want to get into this and rush into it. Um, QGIS is starting another crowd campaign for actually working with LIDAR. So you'll be able to analyze, extract, and manipulate LIDAR data, not just look at it. We're going to look at it here in a minute. Um, PostGIS gets faster. Yeah, Goodall or GDAL. I, I, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the chat too. I, I was told I was not supposed to talk in the chat, but yeah, how do you pronounce GDAL or Goodall? Uh, uh, and mobile. Mobile is everywhere. Mobile is... Um, I'm currently using uh, Mergen in a cemetery mapping project. Mergen's built off QGIS, and uh, I'm doing a volunteer project with the cemetery. QField has come out. Uh, there's Smash. There, there's the world is large now with mobile. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to go out and do stuff. What am I running generally? I'm talking to you guys through a Linux laptop. Um, I got a couple of laptops that, that run stuff. I've got one desktop that's racked out with RAM that runs PostGIS. Um, almost everything I build has to be as Esri friendly or spreadsheet friendly at least. And, and you know, spreadsheets I get through LibreOffice and um, Geo packages that magic bullet for me. If if you guys you know if somebody needs something Esri friendly, Geo package is the way to go. Um, the nice thing is. When I'm working, 90% of my time is data related. I'm not so much worried about what software you're running. I'm just worried about getting it right and trying to do the right analysis and fixing your data, whatever we need to do. Sometimes stuff breaks, everything breaks. Uh, people do call me with huge problems. Sometimes my clients have huge problems. Generally, it's of their own making. So it takes, you know, it's a pretty quick fix. Uh, my computer life is very boring with a lot of memory, a lot of RAM. Uh, I don't need a gaming computer. I don't need really anything special. Just get a computer and go. Um, I've got a virtual server sitting out on the internet that I run stuff off if I need it. Um, you know, it's just, there's a, there's a lot. Um, you know, it's, it makes buying a computer so much easier, though. <laughs> the the workstation I'm on, picked it out over Christmas, ordered it. Uh, very boring Dell, but it's Linux friendly. And I just keep working along and just, you know, don't really worry about anything but but data. But my first love is QGIS. I'm going to talk to you guys about Q, QGIS or Quantum GIS just a little bit to kind of give you a glimpse into the community. And, you know, I ran through the, all these slides talking about, you know, what happens when you have an itch, a project starts, you build a community, does it survive? Well, with QGIS, it's actually probably the coolest group of people you'll ever get to talk to. Uh, they have their own conference. 
Um, they're an organization. They're a nonprofit based out of Switzerland. They have a chair. They have a board. They have a project steering committee. Um, they have voting members that are appointed. You, you've got a budget. You have user groups. There's a QGIS.us. We're not super active, but we have our moments. Um, we got a YouTube channel. We got some got some training classes up there. Um, you know, and they they do quite a bit. I mean, they have a, a huge infrastructure. This little piece of software that you download, QGIS, has a tremendous amount of stuff going on in the backfield. What kind of stuff's going on in the backfield? They publish their budget. This year, QGIS, for those of you that love QGIS, is running off a budget for 2022 of 241,250 euro which right now a euro is almost equivalent to a US dollar. So you're looking at a quarter mil budget-ish to build QGIS and keep it running every year. Uh, that's pretty amazing considering you're getting what you get with this free download. You know, you're getting the equivalent of a desktop, a lot of extensions for spatial analysis, uh, a lot of plugins and a lot of good stuff. Uh, $241,000. So right now their projected shortfall is probably 2,000 euro. They'll make that up somehow. And, um, you know, you just kind of see what happens. Through QGIS training, uh, the trainers have provided back nearly 17,500 euro. That's not too bad, considering it's about 20 bucks a person when we teach a class um, to, that goes back in. Super nice people. And they're super studious. And so they have a release program for QGIS. You are not going to be surprised when the next version of QGIS comes out because they got that laid out for a year. You know when it's going to happen. And right now, so 9.9. Okay, so we just got an update. So the next one will be 10.21, 3.28. That was a month off. So um 1021, uh, October 21st, we'll see the release of uh, 3.28 and 3.22. Uh, they release twice a year. They release two different versions. One is a, I would call a stable version. It gets updated, maybe eight service packs during the year. Um, it's great for organizations. It's great for universities. It's stable. Nothing new is gonna happen. It's gonna sit and be pretty for a year. The development version, which I run for everything, gets updated every four months, and you get a, a one month of testing it, three months of release, then a new version comes out. And so at the end of this, at the end of the year, that new development version becomes the newest long-term release. So that's how you, you know, that's how that's how that's developed. It's been really, really nice. And the cool thing is also, for instance, June 10th, Evan announced that through three different groups funding him, uh, he's been able to back engineer the file-based geodatabase. And so QGIS, probably at the 328 release, will be able to make an Esri file-based geodatabase. You'll be able to edit it, work with it, play with it. And this is all through a crowdfunding um, campaign. And it also works on non-Intel platforms for you Mac people. You too should be able to use file-based geodatabase and uh, not have a problem with it. QGIS is all the, all the time they're crowdfunding. And um, you're seeing now, you know, enhanced elevation data point cloud. This was from last year. They just announced today a new crowdfunding to do editing with uh, QGIS. And again, we all benefit from this communal aspect of, of developing software, um, GDAL, Google, needed some uh, updating and it needed some money. And so there was a, a, a push in 2018 to go ask people, hey, we need, we need some money. You guys are all benefiting from this. Let's donate. So they raised $144,000 and a lot of different people donated. Safe Software, FME, donated $31,000. Uh, this weird company, Esri, donated 30000 Yes, Esri donated to the open source crowd. They use, they use Google on the back end for Arc Pro and Arc Map. Uh, that handles all their raster functionality. I mean, they, they're, they're on the bandwagon, too. They just don't hear about it a lot. So 
out of this grew the new Google organization to, uh, you know, to help them kind of move along and have some structure and, and, you know, a better feel for everybody. One of my clients, uh, 911 up in West Tennessee, they were running ARC and they were, they were hurting. They, they were sneaker netting everything. They, they would save stuff to USB, run it to another computer. Things weren't working very well. They had no central setup. Uh, they had looked at purchasing more software and uh, we actually came in and replaced it all with, with QGIS and PostGIS. And, um, you know, and, and they had many a time they would take their data out in the field on a flash drive. And so I'd get out of the truck and drop the flash drive or something or it'd fall between the seats and you're, you know, you're going to lose a whole county's worth of data. Um, we went in and fixed it. And, um, and GeoPackage became our delivery format to the state. We talked to the states. We can do this. You guys can read it with Esri software. We built one script four years ago and it's been running and it's only broken once. Um, actually open source the whole thing up on GitHub, talking about community. Will this project survive? Eh, I'm going to keep working on it. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to attract a whole lot of uh, 911 nerds over to it. Probably won't flourish or do anything really cool, but it's fun to work with. And it's teaching me a lot about GitHub. Um, and I got another guy, Kyle's helping me from Pennsylvania on it. He's kind of gotten roped into it and you know, we're, uh, we're kicking along. Henry County will benefit because as we get this built out, they'll get a new version of their server set up. But now it's time for a demo. Very, very quickly. I have babbled for 41 minutes about stuff. So you guys have probably all seen QGIS. Move QGIS over here. This is in West Tennessee. This is the Pinson Aerial, Pinson Indian Mounds. Actually, let me reopen the browser. So this is what QGIS looks like. For those of you who haven't seen it, uh, this, is, this is my first love. Never forget your first open source, you know, package that you fell in love with. It was QGIS. And uh, it's, it's very boring looking. Looks very much like ArcMap for those of you who run ArcMap. Um, this is a digital elevation model. I can go in and make it look a little bit prettier. Uh, and in fact, I probably will make it look just a little bit prettier here. Symbology, let's make it pseudo color. Oh, let's do, let's do the boring red to green. So this is the Pinson Indian Mounds, West Tennessee. If you go over to West Tennessee, if you imagine Memphis is at seven o'clock in Nashville's at two o'clock, somewhere in between Memphis and Nashville, probably right about where the, the, the bolt goes into the clock, Pins and Indian Mounds. I need to go out there because I've used this demo twice. Um, this is LIDAR derived elevation data, um, fairly boring. I'm gonna very quickly jump in here and do some processing and we're gonna run a hill shade. And I got to be able to spell Hillshade to run it. And let's run it. And so now if I go in and look, hey, Indian Mounds. So there's some, you know, fairly developed Indian Mounds out here. It's a state park. And where's the really weird one? Yeah, here's the really weird one with the uh, wall going around it. Um, you know, and again with QGIS, I can kind of go in here and play around a little bit. I'm gonna do a lot of clicking and not tell you anything of what I'm doing, but we're gonna multiply this down. And it's just gonna look a little bit prettier. So you can see now there's, there's Indian mounds kind of built everywhere. Here's the really cool thing. And you take nothing else away from this. The, uh, the poodle crowd, the PDAL crowd, uh, PDAL is part of the crowdfunding campaign came in and said, hey, we want you to be able to use our LIDAR. So I can now drag and drop LIDAR, which for Tennessee, we've got a whole state's worth of LIDAR. And to go to a county, a very small county or another, you know, city, someplace, maybe not the wealthiest and go, hey, here's all this free LIDAR data. You're on your own. 
for viewing it or for looking at it, you've got this free data viewer now that you can go in and take a look at your LiDAR data. And that's fairly ugly. <laughs> it's not the prettiest, you know, view, but I can go in and now look at it in 3D. Before I do that, let's change the outlook just a little bit. And let's classify it by ramp. Let's classify it by Z. And out in West Tennessee, you're not going to, if you go above 750 feet, something's wrong. It's pretty flat. Um, so again, now you can see all the points. If I turn off maybe the DM and the hill shade, you can kind of see it popping up a little bit. Uh, when, when Tennessee releases this, they don't necessarily clean it up very much. They do classify it, but they, their, their classification follows the ASPRS standard. So, you know, you get buildings, trees, ground, uh, noise, different things are done. Okay, let's see how cool this is. Mama said never do a live demo. Let's make a new 3D map view. Let's pull this in. I really need to make this look less red. Let's change, I don't know, 900. Yeah, that helped a lot. But here's my LiDAR data. So if I wanna go in and let's do some lighting. So I'm actually looking at point cloud data. And from here, you can see this Indian mound. They've actually got a tunnel going in. You can see where the, uh, the LIDAR hit. Pretty slick. And this is all through the interoperability of QGIS, PUDAL, uh, GDAL, a whole bunch of, whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of really smart people got together and made this work. Um, and it's a really great data viewer. And it gives you ability to look at LIDAR um, you know, and gives, gives a lot of people in the state of Tennessee the ability to go in and look at this. Now, the very interesting thing with this is if I'm going to pull up the DEM, let's go ahead and drag this up here. Here's where everything's going to get really, really crowded. Uh, oops, and I closed my 3D viewer. Let's see if we can't reopen that. There we go. Let's go in and look at elevation profile. I want the Pinson DEM to participate in this profile. Let's do it fill below. So now if I want to take a look here, I can draw a transect. And I don't know how well you can see that, but you can start to see, here we go, the Indian Mound. Um, with all this development and with, with uh, you know, with, with the LIDAR, with crowdfunding, with Hoodle, all this stuff, we've now got in QGIS the ability to view the LIDAR and actually run a transect across here, taking a look at it. And if I run this transect through trees, uh, man, there's another one right here. So if I want to run another transect here, and if I want to view my point data, is something outlandish, make it a 10. Ah, didn't show up in here. But I can start to measure tree height. And that's the interesting thing with, you know, now with this transect stuff, Tennessee is about to have multi-year LIDAR. So we can actually go in now and start measuring tree height, um, you know, using these tools, these freely open available tool sets that are, you know, developed out in the open. We even know what the budget is for getting all this done. I think the newest budget for the crowdsourcing to edit LIDAR is 75,000 euro. Um, you know, once that's done, it's released for free. Everything's good. So 
again, really, really cool stuff happening. Um, all open source, you know, again, you make modifications to the software. It's then passed along. Community of people working. Um, you know, and I, I, pointing at any of these projects is, is if any are, are more successful than QGIS, I guess OpenStreetMap, you could say, is probably as successful, but but this one, you know, tends to make everything just amazing um, that you can use this to work with. And again, you know, with the 911 going back to the project, they're getting a lot of, you know, tools for free and to be able to leverage LiDAR as a 911 or anything, hey, it works. And you don't have to abandon your Esri software. You can use this alongside it. You don't, you can, you know, do whatever you want to do and just be happy. It's all I'm asking you to do. Keep your art pro, install QGIS, you know, go out and do it. Uh, it doesn't have to be one versus the other. I've, I've heard that. Oh man, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, well, you know, if you install that, you got to get rid of the other stuff. No, you don't. Uh, you can use it all. And, um, you know, there's plenty of options for support. There's plenty of options for training. Hey, we love you. Install the software. Join the open source crew. Come to the North America conference. Come to the Nashville conference. Um, and just worry about your data. That's what we're here for. Um, that's why we're all here, really, is the data. We're just using different tools to look at it and play with it. But, and with that, I have run through, oh, I left off my last slide of angst, anger, questions, or anything else. But hopefully you guys learned a little bit um questions worried ah, tim's got a question is qgs lightweight on your existing system yeah it, it's pretty lightweight i think um um so i'm running this laptop has an Intel, an i7 chip in it and a 32 gig of ram now i got a little bit more ram than normal but Usually eight gig of RAM, you should be able to run QGIS and be just perfectly happy. I say that, and one student I'm helping with with a Mac, she's got a very lightweight MacBook, and it's uh, it's choking a little bit. <laughs> we did some LiDAR stuff, and I think I may have broke it uh, the other day, but it's a Mac. Those things, everybody tends to run everything at once on a Mac. So I think she had her texting and Spotify and like, everything running through the Mac. So uh, Naomi said, in terms of getting support and asking help. So there's a Slack channel called the Spatial Community. They kind of cover a little bit of everything. Esri open source, um, you know, all that good stuff. For QGIS, I started the QGIS listserv. There's an international and there's a North America one. And the North America one has bits and spurts of usage. Um, it's kind of quiet, but the international one's really busy. And I'm hoping the US one gets busier. I mean, the more we do, the more these type of presentations happen, hopefully it gets busier. But yeah, I don't really have a good go-to. Uh, I kind of don't like Slack. <laughs> hey, there it is. Slack's like one more thing for me to have to worry about. So I don't, I don't participate that much in Slack. Uh, I still love email. <laughs> so. Hey, Randall, thank you. And I wanted to point out um, rather humorously that Tim actually asked a question quite a bit earlier. Uh, and in the true spirit of open source, we had a couple of responses, uh, crowdsourcing some information there, but. Uh, nice. <laughs> but, but, uh, but Tim asked, uh, what's the best, easiest way to dip your dip uh, your toe into open source GIS for a recovering Esri hack? Um, <laughs> so, you know what? Uh, yeah. yeah, and and let's see. Oh, yeah, I'm sitting here looking now. What's the best way to dip your toes into it? So hold on just a minute. You guys may hear a noise. YouTube. And I'm gonna put post a link in here, QGIS workshop uh, from the North America meeting. Ah, and here it is. So As owner of Mintmobile, I wanted to introduce you don't want to see Ryan Reynolds. Ah, pause, quit, stop. Stop. Uh, let me post the link in here. Uh, but we did we did a uh, meeting, we did a QGIS meeting in 2020 during the pandemic. 
and um, it uh, it went really well. It went two days. It was just a, all virtual, all crazy, and we did two different, I don't know, four different training classes, one QGIS intro class in Spanish, one QGIS intro class in English, um, both of them done completely wildly differently. One was one was done uh, doing geologic mapping out of Colorado. So yeah, get on YouTube and take a look. Uh, you'll see the link when this when that video comes up of the uh, QGIS North America meeting. So um, yeah, take a look at that and see see how to do it. And other than that, download QGIS, join the listserv, and ask questions. I mean, they're a fabulously nice group of people. Um, they've been nicer to me than, than, than I deserve because I actually popped off on them one time. I got really upset about something and and uh, regretted like, just, oh man, I shouldn't have been that mean about it. But they're just super cool people and uh, super smart people too. Because once you email the list, all the developers are watching the list. They'll email you back <laughs> and, you know, what's your problem? Let's talk about it and uh, fix it for you. Um Oh yeah, Naomi knows uh, Michelle, <laughs> Michelle Tobias. Um, she did the workshop and uh, her data and everything, I believe up until the last time I checked a few months ago was all still uh, available. So uh, you can download the data and work through her workshop. And um, I'm gonna do some more classes. I'm trying to decide how to do them the rest of the year. I've actually been silly busy with work and haven't been doing a lot of QGIS classes. I need to do one just as a benefit for QGIS and just donate the money to them. Um, maybe I can do that and donate it towards the crowdfunding campaign. But um, yeah, you know, and, uh, man, I'm trying to think, where would you dip your toes into it? I will say just download it and start breaking stuff. <laughs> download some data and start tearing stuff up. Um, I'm big into breaking things. But yeah, great. Uh, well, thanks, Randall. Um, we no have uh, about four more four more minutes here. So if there's any last minute questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, you know, if not, uh, there's a lot of sources out there. You know, you've discussed quite a bit of them. Um, Phosphor G Nashville. Um, yeah. Again, you know, really, uh, really appreciate your time today. It was a great talk, and uh, we had a great oh, turnout. So, no, oh, thanks for thanks for giving me a shout. Let me do it. This this stuff's fun. <laughs> All right, Kurt, oh, Kurt says you're a rock. Star. Curtis says you're no, a rock. No, I'm not a rock star, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can't start drinking till afternoon. Well, in Technic Vegas, it is afternoon. <laughs> All right. Well, and again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm looking at the uh, at the map here um, that you could sign in and drop your information. We had a great spread. We got folks from the West Coast. We got folks from up north, across Texas, in the Midwest. Um, and it looks like about 18% of our respondents have never attended one of our speaker series before. So welcome and thank you for joining. We hope you uh, we hope you come back and see us again. Um, and uh, I guess if there's nothing else, no other comments, um, we can close this out, uh, give you guys two minutes back and, uh, and we'll see y'all next time. Cool. Thanks a lot. Y'all have a good day.